Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Elliot Aronson, one of the most distinguished social psychologists in the world. His books include The Social Animal and Cooperation in the Classroom, The Jigsaw Method. He co-authored the book on cognitive dissonance, Mistakes Were Made by, But Not By Me, with Carol Tavris, and has also fairly recently written, in, written his autobiography, Not By Chance Alone. The latter two I've read and would highly recommend. He was chosen by his peers as, as one of the 100 most influential psychologists of the 20th century and has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is the only psychologist to have won all three of the American Psychological Associations, Association's top awards for writing, for teaching and for research. He's here to talk to us today a little bit about his life and the theory of cognitive dissonance. Hello, Elliot. Welcome to the MWS podcast. Hi, Barry. Good to be with you. OK, well, maybe could, could we start off by you telling us a little bit about your early life and background? Well, uh, yeah, sure. I, um, I was born uh, in 1932, uh, right at the height of the Great uh, Economic Depression of the 1930s. And uh, my uh, family was very poor. My father was uneducated. He was an immigrant from uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a, a, a very a marginal education. I think he went to school for about five years and um, was a peddler, uh, sold uh, socks and underwear. And then when the Depression hit, he lost. He had a small store that he lost and um, he was unemployed for a long time. So we were in great poverty and uh intellectually as well as financially. We didn't, I don't remember that we had any books in the house. Mm -hmm. um, I, my family was religious. We're Jewish, and we were the only Jewish family in a virulently anti-Semitic, um, blue-collar, working-class uh, neighborhood. And uh, my parents uh, uh, wanted me to go to Hebrew school, uh, which I did after school, after regular school every day, yeah. Um, yeah. four days a week. And uh, in this anti-Semitic neighborhood, uh, coming home from Hebrew school in the dark at, in the evening um, was a bit of an adventure always because I would be um, harassed and sometimes uh, beaten up by um, a gangs of kids shouting anti-Semitic slogans. And that's indeed one of my earliest memories as a, as a, so <laughs> a sort of social psychological memories is after one of these beatings, I remember sitting on a curbstone, uh, nursing a, a, a bloody nose and a cut lip and um, asking myself why these kids hated me so, so much when they didn't even know me. Yeah. And asking myself, gee, if they got to know me better and realized that I was rather a sweet, shy little boy, harmless, uh, would they get to like me? And if they got to like me more, would they then hate other Jews less than they did. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't realize it at the time, of course, but these were incredibly important social psychological questions. Yeah. <laughs> Would I be right in saying that you first came across social psychology somewhat inadvertently? Yes. Um, if, first of all, I, you know, going to college was uh, uh, almost an accident. I, I wasn't a very good student in high school. I was, you know, sort of a B minus student uh, around the middle of my class, and I wasn't thinking very much of college. But um, Brandeis University had just opened its doors. It just began a couple of years earlier, and they were looking for students. And I did very well on the. Um, SAT exams, which were a prerequisite. So in spite of the fact that I had mediocre grades, they not only admitted me, but gave me a, a, a work-study scholarship, which was the only way that I could have gone to college. Now, I started, made, my father died uh, when I was 17 years old, and we were in debt. And 
but my father did uh, encourage me to go to college but before he died, but he thought I should do something practical. So I was majoring in economics because that seemed, <laughs> seemed like, a, since we were in poverty, it seemed like a practical thing to major in. But quite by accident, I wandered into a lecture, a classroom being taught by um, Abraham Maslow in introductory psychology. I did it because... I was having coffee with an attractive fellow student, a young woman that I was interested in romantically. And since she had to go to class, I sort of went, went with her to her class, sitting in the back of the room. And I learned, and Maslow was lecturing on prejudice. And he was raising the same questions that I had asked myself when I was sitting on that curbstone. Like, what causes prejudice? Can it be overcome? by experience and things of that sort. And for the first time in my life, I realized that there was a science of social psychology that one could actually study and, uh, and maybe find some of the answers to these questions. So I immediately changed my major from economics to psychology and became a protege of Maslow's. Okay. And then you also say in your book that um, Maslow uh, helped you to, um, become an optimist in a, in a sense. How, how did he do that? Well, Maslow had a very positive view of human nature and its perfectibility. And so that uh, Maslow's major uh, notion was that uh, people, once they, once people can satisfy their basic needs, like the need for food and shelter and uh, things of that sort, then they could aspire to higher needs so that people could change. Now, I, I was a very shy uh, kid uh, at growing up, and I was worried that I might always be shy. But Maslow's notion of that you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, that you can change, that you can grow, that you can become with hard work and uh, you know, keeping your eye on the ball, living in the present, enjoying the present, but moving toward becoming who you want to be was his basic message. And I embraced that um, very vigorously. It just made me realize that I didn't have to be uh, what I thought I was. I could become um, better, more interesting, more exciting, less shy, etc. And that, that was a very important message for me. Did he call that uh, self-actualization? That, that was his basic notion. That was self-actualization is a process. It's not an ultimate goal. It's a process. And indeed, I find myself moving closer and closer toward becoming a self-actualized person. I'm now 82 years old, and <laughs> maybe someday in the future I will get there. <laughs> okay, and then then you came into um, contact with Leon Festinger, first as yeah. your teacher stroke mentor, then later as a colleague and a, and a friend. Uh, now, there was a certain degree of dissonance on your part when you first met him, is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, Leon Festinger had a re reputation well-deserved for being both a genius and a very difficult person. He was, a, or one could almost say, a nasty person. He was an angry young man. He was uh, 39 years old when I met him. Uh, he was a, a professor, an already an eminent professor at 39. I was a brand new uh, first year graduate student. And he had a reputation, and his reputation for nastiness was a little frightening and almost made me decline to enter his seminar. But I, I entered it, and um, <laughs> I'll tell you a little my favorite Festinger anecdote. Uh, he assigned a term paper in that seminar. In the seminar, I saw he was absolutely brilliant. I mean, I've, I've known an awful lot of people in my life. I've been in, I've been hanging around universities for, um, for over 60 years. And uh, I've known a lot of very, very smart people. Some were my professors, some were my colleagues, some were my students. Leon Festinger is the only person I would, I have ever met who I would call a genius. He was an absolute genius. And I really, and I saw that in the in the uh, early days of the seminar, where he was 
just now developing at that time the theory of cognitive dissonance. Um, but um, he was also nasty. He signed a term paper, and I wrote the paper and handed it in. Um, a few days later, I was walking past his office, and uh, he called me in, and he said, uh, Aronson, come in here. And he, he picked a paper off of the stack of papers on his desk, picked out my paper, held it between his thumb and forefinger at arm's length, turning his head away from it, and said, I believe this is yours. And <laughs> so I said, with false bravado, oh, I guess you didn't like it very much. <laughs> and he said, and he put this look on his face, which was a mixture of uh, contempt and, um, and pity, but sort of a sorrowful, angry look on his face. And he said, uh, that's right, I didn't like it very much. And the contempt was that I was wasting his time. Yeah. And the pity of, of the look was he felt sorry for me that I had been born brain damaged. <laughs> uh, so I took the paper and, I, uh, and I, uh, I, I took it away and I sat down with it and I thought, boy, and I was going to resign from his seminar. I thought, I, you know, I, I don't need this. And uh, I, I was feeling very insecure. And But then I reread the paper uh, and tried to read it through his eyes. And I realized that it was a slipshod job. It wasn't, it wasn't completely well-reasoned. So I took it home. And for the next three days, I really worked very, very hard on it. And I improved it, I think, a lot. Then I brought it back to him put it on his desk, and I said, you might like this better. And then I went back to a room where I had a desk, where a lot of the graduate students had a desk. And I sat there, and to his great credit, he must have dropped whatever he was doing and read the paper because he came into where I was sitting, sat down on the edge of my desk, put the paper in front of me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, now this is worth criticizing. Wow. It was a great statement. This is worth criticizing. And, and it, it stayed with me for 60 years because it's absolutely right. If the most precious gift he could give me was his time. And that's what he gave me at that point. At that moment, he said, OK, you're meeting me halfway. You're doing the best you can. Now I can work with you. Yeah. And that opened the door yeah. to uh, a relationship that was extremely important, a warm friendship, a mentoring relationship. Uh, he taught me a great deal, and became we became very close friends. Uh -huh. Well, what a wonderful story, Elliot. He made a famous prediction, didn't he, about a, a religious sect that were themselves making a prediction. The group got their prediction woefully wrong, but, but his, however, proved correct about the group, and thus, in a way, establishing a cognitive dissonance theory. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. His first big, almost one could say a field experiment, there was a group that was predicting the end of the world. And they said this was a group that was how, existed near Chicago, Illinois. And they were saying that the world was going to end on a particular date. And just before it ended, a spaceship was going to drop down into the yard of the leader of this sect and rescue a spaceship from a ship from outer space. Everyone would board that ship, everybody who belonged to that sect, and it would whisk them away to another planet, and then the Earth would be destroyed. And it was supposed to come at midnight on a particular date. Um, what Festinger and a couple of his colleagues infiltrated the group because they wanted to see what would happen if the world didn't come to an end. And so uh, they infiltrated the group, and there it was. At midnight came and passed. They were waiting out in the yard for the spaceship. And, and, you know, at first they looked at their watches, and they thought maybe their watches were wrong. Maybe their watches were a little small. But after a couple of hours, they realized that the spaceship wasn't coming, and they looked very depressed. Now, this is a group, by the way, that they really believed that they would be whisked into outer space. They quit their jobs. They gave away their cars, their homes, everything, because who needs a car in outer space and who needs money? Uh, 
but then what they did to reduce the dissonance of having given away all this stuff and having committed themselves to this belief, they then developed the belief that it was because of their devout piety and their prayers that they had actually saved the world from being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then, so Festinger's prediction was that they would then begin to proselytize because now they really believed with great thoroughness that they, their belief was correct. Not that the, that the earth would be destroyed, but that their prayers actually saved the, the world so that they now wanted everybody to join. So for the first time, they began to actively proselytize new members. Yeah. That was his prediction. Their prediction failed. His prediction succeeded. Okay, so then what is dissonance theory? Well, dissonance theory, as, as uh, Festinger originally uh, stated it, is that if a person holds two cognitions, ideas or attitudes, that taken together, uh, the one is the opposite of the other, yeah. it creates cognitive dissonance, which is uh, uh, painful, and that people will try to reduce the dissonance either by changing one or both cognitions to bring them closer together, uh, or by or denying that one exists, or anything like that. Um, it, very, power, very simple theory, very powerful, very powerful. Could you give an example? I, I think the, the popular example is one of smoking, isn't it? The one that he gives is about smoking, like if a person um, uh, smokes two packs of cigarettes a day, and uh, then learns that smoking causes cancer and shortens life. Uh, and he tries to, to quit smoking, but can't quit. So the cognition, I'm smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, is dissonant with the cognition that I, that's going to cause my painful death. And how do you reduce that dissonance? Well, you try to convince yourself that the evidence linking smoking to cancer is uh, correlational, and it's really, you know, there are... And what about my uncle uh, Charlie, who's uh, 89 years old and has been smoking three packs a day all his life, and he's still alive? Uh, <laughs> and uh, but, or I would rather die a uh, a little bit early and still have a a, a lovely debonair life, and uh, uh, or that uh, obesity is a problem and smoking keeps me from becoming obese. And there are all kinds of justifications for smoking that one can add that would reduce the distance between those two very powerful cognitions. Yeah, and but then you then took cognitive distance theory a stage further by um, arguably saying this is not just a cognitive theory, just two ideas clashing in the mind. Dissonance is especially painful and difficult when the conflict involves a clash with some important self-concept or ego identification, such as I'm kind, I'm ethical, I'm clever, I'm reliable, etc. Given the choice between this identification and the evidence, we then tend to dismiss the evidence. Is that right? Yeah, I think that uh, it is most powerful. I mean, any two cognitions can be dissonant, but the major one is I think I'm a smart person and I've done something incredibly stupid. Um, that that can be uh, that is an extremely painful form of dissonance. And of course, because I don't want to admit that I'm that I don't want to change my self concept of being smart, I will try to convince myself that the thing I did was not really that stupid after all. Uh, 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 leaders of countries are very prone to to um, argue that way. Uh, George W. Bush, for example, uh, would never admit that invading Iraq had, was not a very smart thing to do. Uh, he, he now believes that uh, leaving Iraq was the stupid thing to do, but invading it was really smart. Um, and, you know, that, that it's very interesting to watch uh, politicians do that dance because when they invaded Iraq, uh, when Bush ordered an invasion of Iraq, thinking, believing fully, I believe, he believed that uh, Saddam Hussein had me weapons of mass destruction. And then when they couldn't find any, he kept saying, oh, they're there, all right. Iraq's a big country. We'll eventually find them. And when months and months went by and they didn't find them, then he reduced dissonance by saying, well, but we got rid of a bad guy. 
Yeah. He's a bad guy anyway, and it was good to get rid of him. Yeah. And then as, and now we see what's going on there, which uh, would be very, very hard to reduce. Yeah, yeah. So, so dissonance theory then goes against behavioral theory that people do things primarily for the, the rewards they bring. The economist view that people generally make rational decisions and this psychoanalyst view that the acting aggressively gets rid of aggressive impulses. Right, right. So th there was in, indeed a very in interesting experiment that challenged the idea that, that venting anger is cathartic. C could you tell us about that? Yes, the Freudian notion of catharsis is that, you know, if you're feeling angry and you vent it, uh, you express that anger, it's really good for you uh, and gets rid of it and then you don't feel anger anymore. Now, when I first started teaching at Harvard University, uh, there was a graduate student there, a wonderful guy named Michael Kahn, who was doing his PhD, his doctoral thesis, and he was a Freudian, and he was trying to show that um, venting anger reduces anger. So he did the simple, nice, very nice, clever experiment where he insulted a person, and then his supervisor came in, and at one point the supervisor gave the insulted person a chance to vent his spleen against Michael, uh, which he did. And then uh, in, the, uh, in the control condition, he didn't have that opportunity. And then afterwards, uh, the, the uh, participants were asked their impression of Michael. And it turns out that the results came out just the opposite of what Michael Kahn predicted. Those who vented their spleen against him actually hated him more afterwards than those who weren't given that opportunity. And um, and I had just come from Stanford where I had worked with Festinger on dissonance theory. And so when Michael had difficulty understanding, he came to me and he said, somebody said I should come see you, that you would have an explanation. He said, I, I can understand if we, if we didn't get any results at all, if it was a wash. Yeah. But I got just the opposite of what I predicted. Can you can you understand that? Can I understand it? It's a wonderful ex dissonance experience, experiment that you've conducted without realizing it. And that is that if if I express anger at you, I will then try to justify the fact that I have expressed this anger, that I've told somebody else what a what a bastard you are. Yeah. And then I will come to believe it even more because uh, anger expressed leads to a, a sequence of expression of anger that gets justified and that results in even more anger once it's justified. Aggression leads to more aggression. Yeah. So aggression begets self-justification, which begets more aggression. It, it just escalates. Exactly right. But then conversely... Um, you, you suggest in the, the book that compassion also begets compassion. I'm, I'm thinking here of the Faber experiment. Yes, a couple of my students did this wonderful ex little experiment that was just the opposite of the aggression experiment. That on the one hand, they were asked by the departmental secretary if they would return some money they had earned for participating in an experiment because the psychology department's budget was very low and we needed every bit of money we could get. In the other condition, could you return it because the experimenter's uh, funding was low and he needed it? And, uh, and in, all, in all, both conditions, uh, all the participants agreed to return the money that they had earned. Yeah. And then they were asked to evaluate the experimenter. And when they thought they were returning it to him, they increased their liking for him. When they thought they were returning it to this faceless department, they didn't increase their liking for the experimenter. So a favor being done. We know that if, if I do you a favor, you might like me better. Mm -hmm. But the, what distance theory predicts is that if I do you a favor, I will like you better. For, because I have done you the favor. Fascinating, yeah. Now, now you stress that self-justification is normally a, a healthy strategy that you know that helps us sleep at night and and function effectively without 
constantly beating ourselves up. After all, we, we make hundreds of decisions all the time, don't we? Uh, nevertheless, we ne need to be on the lookout for, for when it can become destructive. Exactly right. As you say, in the normal uh, life, we make a lot of decisions. Some are important, some are unimportant. And a little bit of self-justification is okay. It keeps us from being totally neurotic, from um, second-guessing everything we do. Yeah. From the shirt we put on in the morning to the to the mate we choose, uh, we you know a, a wise person once said we should keep our eyes wide open before marriage and half closed after marriage, and I think that makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, we 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 would have difficulty sleeping at night if we uh, if we didn't justify a lot of our decisions. On the other hand, there are some decisions we make where we shouldn't sleep at night. You know, like the one I mentioned before, George Bush invading Iraq, causing thousands of lives to be lost and, uh, and trillions of dollars in expense. And uh, he shouldn't sleep at night after that decision. He shouldn't be justifying it. So that it's Scylla and Charybdis. Yeah. There are, there are two things to avoid. On the one extreme beating the crap out of yourself every time you make a decision, and on the other extreme, justifying decisions to the point where you're not behaving reasonably. Okay, but, but is self-justification the same as lying? No, it's, it's worse. It's lying to yourself. Uh, lying to others is one thing. If you're aware that you're lying, you know, if you tell your friend that her address is really attractive when it isn't attractive. That's a simple little thing. But lying to yourself can get you into a great deal of trouble yeah. if you really believe your own justification. But then just back to the George Bush example, is he aware, do you think, that he's, that he's doing it? I don't think so. I think it's an unconscious process. I get into trouble with some of my liberal friends because if they think I'm forgiving George W. Bush because I'm saying he's not aware that he's doing it. Uh, he's not a villain. He's a, he's a fool. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the reason for that is, as I mentioned before, if he were simply trying to deceive the American people and was conscious of that, he wouldn't have used weapons of mass destruction as his excuse for invading Iraq because sooner or later, we will learn that there are no weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, a, a wily politician does not um, come up with a lie that can be easily discovered eventually. So that I think that he was really fooling himself that he was behaving in a, in a, um, a self-justifying way. It was an unconscious process. And that, indeed, is more dangerous than if he was simply lying, because he is unaware of it. Yeah, so he's deluded in a sense, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if letting go of self-justification is so beneficial, then why don't we do more of it? Well, for reasons that I've, are, I think I've indicated, and that is that um, it's painful yeah. uh, um, to let go of it. It's painful to think of ourselves as a stupid person. Uh, if I do a stupid thing, my, the tendency is to say, well, I mean, on the one extreme, this is a Scylla and Charybdis, on the one extreme I can say, oh, my God, am I stupid? How could I have done it? Oh, God, I'm so stupid. On the other extreme is, I didn't do anything stupid. That was actually a very smart thing, okay? Those are, that's Charybdis. Those are the two things. Now, my solution to this uh, dilemma is what I call it um, self-compassion. Self-compassion allows me to say to myself, I've done a stupid thing. That does not necessarily make me a stupid person. Let me look squarely at the stupid or immoral or unethical thing that I've done so that I can learn from it. I am a smart person who has done a stupid thing. If I learn from it, I will not make this mistake again. If I have hurt somebody, I will make amends. Because I've hurt somebody, that does not make me a villain. It makes me a, an ethical person 
who has and a kind person who has done an unkind thing. If I learn from it, I can improve. That that's the middle ground. Yeah. That uh, that is what I'm recommending. That and it requires acknowledgement of the mistake. There's a wonderful example of uh, um, Shimon Peres when he was Prime Minister of Israel. Um, Ronald Reagan was President of the United States, and he went to Bitburg in Germany, and he um, he was mourning the death of the German soldiers who buried at Bitburg. But among those German soldiers were SS anti-Semitic, incredibly cruel, uh, inhumane people. Yeah. And when someone brought that to, to the attention of Shimon Peres and said, what do you think of Reagan now for having gone to Bitburg and honoring these SS members? Uh, Perez said this quite a beautiful statement. He said, when a friend makes a terrible mistake, the mistake remains a mistake and the friend remains a friend. And I love that because the dissonance reduction would be either, well, to say, oh, yeah, I was going to Bitburg and honoring those people. That wasn't so bad. Or to say that Reagan, he, he's a terrible person. But to hold those two cognitions, keep them apart and keep them that way uh, without trying to justify one or the other, that is the middle way. And that requires some self-compassion and some intelligence. Yeah. F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, uh, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is if a person can hold two competing ideas simultaneously and still function. I think that's, that's right, but it's more than intelligence. It requires some self-compassion. Yeah. When you say self-compassion, arguably it also requires acknowledgement of our own fallibility. Uh, you know, if we kept these identifications uh, more, let's say, malleable by cultivating a more uh, provisional sensibility, do you think would be more open to the evidence then as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that that kind of but it, it's tricky because you can't simply. Again, my statement, I did a stupid thing or I did an immoral thing, but that does not make me an immoral person. That could be simply another justification Good. unless you take it very, very seriously. Yeah, yeah. It's also about you, being honest with yourself. Yes. Honest and and the the ability to utilize the information you get from admitting to the blunder and learning from it and learning from it. Otherwise, we're doomed to make the same mistake over and over again. Yeah. But and do you think... You mentioned the book. There, there are also some practices that might be useful, such as awareness building practices, such as meditation or critical thinking. Do you think these things help? I do. I do. I think meditation can be extremely helpful because it calms the mind. It it takes the noise out of. Uh, I, I I meditate twice a day, and I and I and I love it, and uh, I recommend it to everybody. I have a son who is also a social psychologist, Joshua Aronson, mm -hmm. who is going into schools in very difficult neighborhoods, uh, very depressed uh, uh, neighborhoods, and getting the students to meditate. Uh, some of these kids are, you know, future criminals, yeah. and uh, and what he's doing is is bringing in meditation as a way of 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 slowing things down, of calming the noise. And he says, it's a beautiful experience to see these kids who are rowdy, difficult, aggressive, and you watch them meditate and and uh, good things follow from that. Yeah. Oh, that great, absolutely great. And what about critical thinking? You know, the practice of challenging not only our own assumptions, but the, the you know, assumptions of others too. I agree. And, uh, and you know, it's, it, critical thinking should start with self-criticism, should start with critical thinking of our own ideas and of our own tendencies. Uh, I think it's important to be able to ask us, as we're making a decision, to say, am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Because I've really looked at all the information as objectively as I can, or am I justifying in some way? Um, 
you know, the, the problem, you know, one of the things I like about at least my understanding of uh, the middle way, what you call the middle way, is that people tend to jump to conclusions prematurely. Um, if you're if you're if you're considering two extremes, uh, to consider one the right way and the other the wrong way before you look at all the evidence, I think is a terrible mistake because once you jump in one direction or the other, then you begin to distort information as it comes in. Yeah. In, in order to support the choice you've made, and we see that. In the criminal justice system in my country, I'm not sure how it works in your country, but in my country, hundreds of people, innocent people, have been languishing in prison because police interrogators make up their mind early who they think the guilty person is, and then they close off any information that might be dissonant with that implicit decision which makes them believe that their decision was the correct one. Yeah. And occasionally, mostly it is, it is correct, but occasionally it's wrong and that can be a disastrous. And yet to be open to that, yeah. And um, I've sometimes heard um, uh, um, a definition of cognitive bias as simply jumping to conclusion. And, and would you say that cognitive distance is an, an umbrella term for uh, cognitive biases? Yeah, I think so. I think that's cognitive bias is one form of uh, of dissonance. Yeah, and just finally on those questions of practices, what about the arts as well? Do you think the arts also cultivate a, a tolerance of ambiguity and uh, and can help in that regard at all? Uh, it, <laughs> I'm tempted to say it couldn't hurt, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that's. Uh, uh, that's sort of a, a standard a Jewish joke, you know, can't wait. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how, but uh, I think that uh, anything that opens the door to self-reflection. Yeah. Now, you know, the, of course, if you can carry that, that too far and you can be stuck be, on the, you know, between the horns of a dilemma for a long time, I think, I think seeking information in a flexible and open-minded way is always a good practice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So did you think that when people do own up to their mistakes, we, we normally admire them for it? Uh, I, think, I think we do, <laughs> and I, but, I, but we don't quite realize it. You see, and I, that's... That, <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking now of... Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, when he was president of the United States, he had just come into office in 1960 and immediately did one of the great blunders uh, up until that time that our country made, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion, when they invaded Cuba, when he sponsored an invasion of Cuba, which was an absolute disaster. And afterwards, he took full responsibility for it, and his uh, the Gallup poll, his ratings of popularity increased immediately afterwards. Uh, that's a it's a stunning example of uh, of showing fallib fallibility and owning up to having made a mistake uh, is a very very good thing, even politically. But I don't think people believe it, and even though it's the truth, and therefore they dodge around and they try to um, they try to duck away from owning up to having made a mistake. I sometimes think societal pressure plays a part because I think certainly in American culture and to a large extent uh, British culture too, uh, mistakes are seen as a bad thing. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and rather than as an opportunity for learning. Um, in the Japanese culture, it's, what's interesting is that the group takes responsibility and is cheering for the person to make a mistake, uh, to, to confront his mistake and to continue to learn. Uh, we find that when, when Americans go over to Japan to investigate classroom experiences, they often find that a person who makes a mistake is encouraged to, to go on, and it becomes part of the group process to, um, to not punish the person for making a mistake, but to see the mistake as a step toward learning the solution. Yeah, 
Oh, that makes sense. Okay, well, my last question, Elliot. Uh, well, you've, I think you've pretty much answered this, but I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, what is your understanding of the middle way uh, and how, how it might relate to what we've been talking about today? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if I have a full understanding of it, but it is, you know, I, I see it as in, in that uh, chaotic place. <laughs> we, people like to avoid the middle way because uh, it's easier to make up your mind quickly and then uh, begin to reduce distance. But it's that chaotic place where you're looking at where you keep an open mind to all sides until you can gather enough evidence to make a move. Um, uh, William Butler Yeats uh, has this wonderful poem where he talks about uh, the center is not holding. And I think that's a, a great way of putting it, where, where the good people are in the middle, really contemplating, trying to figure things out, whereas the people with, with great passion are are making terrible blunders by being in one extreme or the other. I, that's how I see uh, your group in the middle way, where you're taking a position of waiting for the evidence to come in and examining it very critically uh, before uh, making decisions. And I think that's, that's a beautiful and difficult way to be. Uh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you uh, for that, Elliot. It's been a real pleasure. And, uh, and yeah, again, thank you very much for talking to me today. Barry, good to be with you. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.